Thank you for listening and supporting The Daily Memphian. Sign up for one of our many free newsletters and breaking news alerts at dailymemphian.com slash email to receive the latest local news stories impacting our community. Our weekly newsletters cover everything from sports to arts and culture, business, food, and more, along with daily updates of all the news we publish each day. Sign up or manage your email preferences at dailymemphian.com slash email. What's up, y'all? You're listening to the latest episode of the Tigers Podcast. I'm Frank Bonner, joined by co-host Stephen Johnson, as always. Now, a lot has happened since the last time we recorded a podcast. On the football side, you've got recent recruiting news and coaching changes. And on the basketball side, the three-game winning streak put them right back into the tournament conversation before losing to UCF the other, the other day. But before we jump into all that, I got to make sure you check out some of our other podcasts, starting with Jennifer Biggs, who hosts Sound Bites, Eric Barnes hosts The Sidebar, and you already know our guys Chris Harrington and Drew Hill have got you covered uh, with the Grizzlies podcast every week. You can find all of these anywhere you get your podcasts, including Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and DailyMemphian.com. Now, Stephen, I think a lot of people are wondering, when can we expect this, this Memphis basketball team to, to be at full strength again in terms of, of, of guys back on the roster? What's what's today's day? Today is the 14th, man. I I think you got to hope by the time you get to February when you have some of those real key games at Cincinnati, at Houston, uh, at SMU, and some of those other games um, that you, that you're back full full strength. Uh, on the pregame radio show, they said Alex Lomax might be a week week or so away from coming back. Um, so that'll be big. Just in turn, I know alo has been you know in the crosshairs of a lot of people, but at this point, they just need bodies, man. They were down to basically seven players against uh, UCF after Jaden Hardaway got hurt. So they need bodies. I, I, I think they'll have Alo back within a week or so. Earl, Earl Timberlake's in concussion protocol, so you never know how long that's going to take. And DeAndre Williams has a bad uh, back. So these injuries, I don't think any of them are going to keep them out for the season, but we still might be at maybe a week or two away from the scene, from really getting the Tigers back at full strength, I think. No, it... it- it kind of sucks that it happened at the time it happened in the midst of, of, of that three game winning streak. Now, you know, this UCF loss was disappointing, but considering the fact that they basically had what seven bodies, is this loss as disappointing as some of the other losses they've had? No, no, absolutely not. I mean, I, as of right now, I believe it's a quad one loss. So they Memphis went from on some of the bracketology, they either went from, you know, maybe being one of the last teams in to being on the other side of the bubble. So it's not an ideal result, but overall, like it didn't, it's not a damning loss. Like, you know, to 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 Tulane to or to to Georgia. That Georgia game, I think, is really going to be the one that could end up hurting the Tigers the most. But you know, they're a quality opponent. UCF UCF has beat Michigan and beaten Miami. So it's not like they lost to a bad team. It was a quad one level game. So it's not necessarily the end of the world. The thing is, like you kind of said, it seems like they cured some of the chemistry problems from the early season. And now they got another hurdle because they keep missing, keep missing all these guys. So I think you got to feel like if the Tigers are fully healthy, then you got to love their chances of winning the league and making the tournament relatively easy. But, you know, they're only going to have six, seven, eight guys then, you know, the margin of error is going to be very slim, especially on Saturday going up against the East Carolina team that hasn't really hasn't really beaten anybody of consequence, but they are undefeated at home, and they do th- do they do they a few things well uh, that Memphis has struggled with. So um, it's definitely low on the list of losses, but when you lose to a Georgia, to a Tulane, and some of those other games, at this point, any loss is disappointing and could be kind of could, – could set you back in terms of making a big dance. Now, what are your your thoughts on on Tyler Harris in these last two games? I mean, he's combined eight for 11 from three, uh, 35 points. I mean, he's he's put up some good numbers in the last two games, even in, in the loss to UCF. What is his ceiling this year in terms of how beneficial can he be for this team? 
Well, I, I, I wouldn't be the first to say I was, I was definitely wrong. I thought Tyler at, at best was going to be kind of a, a specialty player, maybe throwing it, throw him in here or there. But I think his ceiling when they're at full strength, I, I, I think he's the perfect six man or him and Landers not only for that. And however they want to do the lineup, because when they get full guys back, we know they're going to make a couple changes. But because of Tyler Harris, let's say when Earl Timberlake gets back, you go Earl. I don't know, Earl, Lester, uh, Imani or Imani or Minot and uh, Jalen and DeAndre. Because you have a Tyler Harris off the bench and maybe you put him with a Landers or whoever else, that could give the Tigers one of the best bench units in the country because you have a guy like Tyler Harris that can not only get you point, get you 20 points on any night against any opponent, he's also not afraid to take and make big shots as well too. So I think he could be a guy – um, he tries hard on defense. There are going to be some nights where his just limitations as a 5'8", five, 5'9 five, guy on defense might just be too much to overcome. But with what he's able to do um, with his offense and his spark plug, I think you could see some games, some big games, say against the Houston, the SMU, where he's kind of one of those five guys on the floor in the final minutes of what, we could, of what could be a close game. Yeah, and I think in terms of what you lack in him defensively just because of his size – I think Memphis is a good enough team defensively to where you can you can still do what you need to do with Tyler Harris on the floor on that side of the ball. Well, usually I, I would agree with you, but the Tigers right now, and I'm not sure if it's because of because of the injuries or as Landers now put it, the mentality, but uh, <coughs> they haven't exactly defended at a level uh, that they're used to. Uh, this is a team that I think is used to being one of the top 10, top five defense in the country. They haven't played to that level. Their raw numbers are, are, are solid for the most part, but their three-point defense in particular has been uh, woeful these last two games. I think they can almost combine, have almost combined to allow 33 pointers in the last two games. So I think um, if they have their full assortment of guys, Earl or DeAndre, then yeah, I think so that you can kind of uh, mask some of his defensive limitations. But right now, He's going to play regardless because they, they just have the bodies. But I think full strength, once they get back their their defensive aces, Earl, Alo, and DeAndre, that, that should definitely help on the defensive end. And you'll see Tyler out there probably a lot more with those groups as well, too. And this may be a odd question to ask coming off of a loss, but from that slump that they had, you know, early on in the season, do you feel like they fully turned the corner from, from that in terms of, you know, the chemistry problems that they had. I know they've got other issues in terms of, of injuries and health, but if they're at a full strength, do you think they've turned the corner to be the team that they, you know, could have the potential to be? I said they, they've turned the corner to be, um, to be a tournament team. Uh, you know, full of, at the beginning of the season, we thought this was a team that had, you know, honestly, second weekend in the tournament, final four aspirations and things of that nature. But um, as of right now, I think right now, if you're the Tigers, you just want to make the tournament. I think at full strength, what they've shown against like Wichita State, Cincinnati, and, and things of that nature, and Alabama as well, too. When they're close to full strength, I do think they're a, a solid NCAA tournament team. And in terms of big picture, if they can kind of reach the ceiling of being a Sweet 16 Elite 18, I really had to see what, what they look like when they um, get back together full strength. Right now, I think they have, when they're when they're all together and playing and have 10, 11 guys available, I think they have more than enough talent to where they'll win games. But some of the miscues that have kind of persisted, can they clean those up? Because I don't know how far you can get in the tournament, turn the ball over the way that they do and not locking up on the, on, on the three-point shot like they haven't been able to do these last couple of games. And in your opinion, where do you think the – Memphis's conference schedule stacks up in terms of, you know, if you're a team in the in the Big Ten, you can take so many losses because you're playing, you know, certain teams that are going to be ranked. You know, you're going to be playing Purdue and, and, and all this other stuff. In the American, I know they've got Houston. UCF was would have been a, a, a good win for them. How many losses can you take in this conference um, compared to some of the other conferences? I think Memphis is probably almost pushing the number of what's acceptable and what's not. You already took the loss to Tulane. You were shorthanded, but still, that that does count. I'm not sure if you can take more than maybe two more. Let's say you split with Houston and maybe you lose to SMU or Cincinnati. I think if you lose four to five, you'll be okay. 
but you have to offset those wins. You have to offset that. I think you've got to win at Cincinnati. Uh, I think you've got to beat Houston at least once. Um, I'm not sure where SMU is at in the net rankings. I know they're, you know, matter of fact, let's look it up right quick. SMU is going to be one of the top teams in the conference, but that's another team I think you need to beat. So the Tigers, you know, right now they're number 80. So there's a chance they could be like a quad one level uh, team by the time they go play at Dallas. So I think Memphis really only has room for maybe one or two more losses. And that's to the top of the conference, you know, uh, Cincinnati, Houston, SMU. But they lose on Saturday to East Carolina or, or Lord forbid you lose to like a South Florida, then I think that's going to be really tough to overcome. So I'm not sure how many more quad three and quad four losses they can take. Um, like I said, the UCF loss wasn't damning, but a loss to I think East Carolina, um, a loss to any of those teams kind of at the bottom of the conference, I definitely think would be um, hard to overcome. Now, before we go over to, to football, um, I know you had a, a a question from at least one Memphis fan um, that we answered. Uh, what, what what was asked to you uh, from that? Well, yeah. Uh, so Rasheed Wallace hasn't been with the team since uh, since the Tulane game. Uh, you know, they had DeAndre Williams and Jalen Duran went to protocol, and so did Rasheed Wallace. He has not been back since then. I asked Penny about it. He said he's still in health and safety protocols, <clears throat> which of course is a long time. <laughs> Uh, almost been a month since I mean not almost been a month it's been a been a couple weeks uh, Penny says there's he's still talking to the team uh, he checked in one checked in on him it doesn't sound like uh he's doesn't sound like he's dealing with anything dire but he hasn't been back with the team so um I think it's fair to wonder uh, if there's anything else going on with that you know with how the situation played out with the vaccination status of the team um at the Tennessee game. I think it's fair to wonder if that has anything to do with it because he has been out a long time. You know, Jalen and DeAndre are back from protocols and they came back pretty quickly. Um, they played in the Wichita State game, which was just a couple of days after the Tulane game. So um, they kind of been hush hush on exactly what's going on. The official the official story is he's in health and safety protocols. It sounds like he's OK, but it doesn't. Um, we haven't really found out any more information on when they can expect him back. Um, I'm not expecting them to be on the bench tomorrow unless something drastic changes. So I think that's something to watch as we get into February is, you know, like, is he still in health and safety protocols or is there something else going on maybe with the administration uh, that's not letting him come back? Now, there was another question, um, you know, in, in, in the mentions, uh, somebody asked, you know, why, basically, why is there more of a fuss about there being an on-campus football stadium versus, you know, on-campus basketball and in my opinion, I think it's because a lot of that comes up when people talk about conference realignment. And I, I think we all know the sport that drives conference realignment the most is football. No matter what market you're in, I know, you know, in Memphis, you know, basketball is, is king out here. But in terms of conference realignment, football is always the one that drives the conversation. And so that's what gets the most talked about in terms of on-campus, off-campus stadiums. And so I just think that that's, that's what moves the needle um, in terms of how programs are perceived. And so I think that's why people talk about that more. I don't know what your thoughts on that is. Uh, I mean, like I said, I think, I mean, you, I think you hit the nail on the head. I mean, it's, it's all about conference realignment and getting Memphis into a bigger program and, and making the program as attractive as it can be. So a new stadium, especially on campus, we love the Liberty Bowl or whatever it's about to be called, but it, it will definitely help. Um, the program I'm not sure like the financially and I think the, the program ideally if they can get the money whether it be through donations or just sponsorships and all and everything else I think the program would love to be able to build an on-campus stadium but we know those things aren't cheap even though it would certainly help Memphis get into the um, probably help Memphis get into a bigger stadium I mean bigger conference but at the same time there's no guarantee Memphis has been passed over before you got you gotta hope they wouldn't be passed over this time but We'll we'll see, but um, also on the football and kind of transitioning. What did you think of the def defensive coordinator hire? I thought, I thought it was a decent hire. Um, I know, uh, you looking at what he was able to do at, at Ohio State when he became basically interim uh, DC. That Ohio State defense did get gradually better under him. You know, being the play caller. So if you're Memphis, uh, that's that's encouraging. And I think him being a younger guy, we talked about this before, 
Um, I think he's going to have some some energy to him in that locker room. And then him being a secondaries coach, I think it's good. If you look at this season, I mean, Memphis played a lot of teams that were just airing it out. So him having that secondaries coach mindset, um, you know, being able to, to, to really hone in on that secondary would help. And then, you know, I, I always like a defensive coordinator that has some type of offensive background. I think it helps you get into the mind of the offensive coach. And he, early in his coaching career, he's had some offensive background. And so I think all that together, he should come to Memphis to do pretty well. I mean, yeah, I, I know when he initially got hired, I know there were some people talking about, well, if he was so great, why didn't Ohio State keep him? I'm like, man, they hired probably the best defensive coordinator in, in the country, or the hottest anyway. So, you know, you're and Ohio I, State, you're chasing Alabama and Georgia. You can't really take a chance experimenting on a younger guy when you got a guy like Jim Knowles out there that you know wants to come there. And no knock on Matt Barnes, because like I said, I do think that he's going to come here and do good, but – I covered Jim Knowles over at Oklahoma State, and I saw him build that defensive program. I mean, his first year was not good at Oklahoma State. Um, and then he just gradually got better. And I was telling some of my guys, you know, over in that market, I was like, I'd be surprised if Jim Knowles is still at OSU um, in you know, Oklahoma State uh, in, in the next three, four years. I thought somebody may try to grab him as a head coach at a smaller program. I mean, I think he's that good. So mm. and knock Matt Barnes for them moving on from him. I mean, it, it, he's not at Jim Knowles' level. We'll see if he can get to a, a, a similar type of level as he gets older in his career. But right now, he's just not no Jim Knowles. And there's nothing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Also on that front, uh, the Tigers picked up <laughs> a pretty big transfer portal get uh, with a running back from uh, Northern Illinois. Uh, what can you tell the fans about uh, what they can get from him? I was just looking at some of his highlights right before this podcast. Um, and what I see from him is that if he has a hole and the hole doesn't need to be that big, he can find the hole and he can burst through. I think that's one of the the, the main takeaways that I saw from just looking at him, uh, you know, real briefly is that his vision is pretty good to where, you know, if he sees a scene, he's going to go. Um, and I think that's what that's what you kind of look for in your running back. Uh, but this running back situation has gotten real interesting with Jay Decker coming to Memphis uh, because, you know, Brandon Thompson, Brandon Thomas, excuse me. You know, before he, before he got hurt, and especially to start the season, he was kind of, you know, he was killing the game. And then all of a sudden Memphis just started to diminish and then he got hurt and everything. And so, um, you know, uh, Jay Decker. He rushed for over he rushed for over 1,100 yards uh, this season, and 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 Memphis is looking for a running back who can do that again. Uh, you got Austin Myers, uh, the offensive lineman, who who said that he was returning. Um, you know, obviously, in order for a running back to do well, you got to have a strong offensive line, and then Memphis is just in desperate need of getting their running game back to the way it used to be. And I think Jay, I think Jay Ducker can help them do that especially when he's a running back who doesn't need that big of a hole in order to bust through. So I think it's a, good, a really good – they're probably their best, in my opinion, their best pickup of this class in terms of transfers. Yeah, absolutely. And we know last year um, they, they landed a bunch of transfer guys. <clears throat> I'm not sure how many of those guys hit, but I think – and a lot of those guys didn't play a, a bunch at the other schools, except for like Grant Gunnell. So I think you bring in a guy that is experienced, has already produced at the Division One level. I think that's huge. And when Memphis, the offense was rolling, the run game, it wasn't just a one-back offense. Uh, they had two, three guys kind of carrying the load. So I, I, I think that was huge as well, too. So now they're looking for an offensive coordinator. Um, Kevin Johns went to Duke. What do you think they should kind of look for in terms of a, a play caller or a recruiter, a schemer? What, what, what's the biggest goal should be for the OC hire? It's got to be a, a, a offensive coordinator who can who can get spicy in his play calling. Um, you know, I know Memphis wants to run the ball, and I think part of the reason why um, they struggled running the ball is is, is uh, the, you know the offensive play is questionable at times. You got to you got to get a coordinator who who can come in, dice some things up in their offensive play calling, make it look like the the Memphis teams of the past who were putting up you know multiple yards and points. Um, obviously, uh, you could be looking at another 
quarterback type of battle situation with, with Seth and Grant. We'll see what happens with all that. But I do think you need an offensive coordinator who who has a, uh, a creative mind in his offensive schemes because this offense this season did look dull at times. And so you want somebody who can spice that up. Well, a lot of a lot of a lot of news happened on the Tigers on both ends. We'll see how the basketball team fares on Saturday. Of course, we got National Signing Day coming up for the football program over the next month. Plus, they got one more big coordinator hired to hire, hired to make. So we'll see what happens, man. Thank you all for joining us. We'll see y'all next week on the uh, next episode of Tigers Podcast.